Radio Richard. Hi, I'm Richard Niles, and welcome to the second part of Pat Metheny, Bright Size Life. You're listening to Pat's tune, The Story Within the Story, and tonight's show will reveal the inner workings of a supremely creative mind, the concepts and methodologies that have made Pat Metheny one of the most fascinating and influential musicians of our time. The desire to create art is the desire to communicate. Proof of Pat Metheny's communication skills can be seen in more than 30 years of phenomenal record sales and sold-out concerts for legions of rapturous fans. Now, Pat's long hair and stripy t-shirts may have made jazz more accessible to a generation of 70s teens who saw him as a rock star, but it was his music, an irresistible combo of jazz, soul, and Beatleish melodicism that touched the hearts of millions. I asked Pat why it had been so important to him to communicate. Where did that intense impulse to tell his secret story to the world come from? I think anybody that aspires to do anything at a high level is somehow trying to reconcile their existence with something that goes beyond what they understand. To me, music itself is a very interesting commodity in the spectrum of the things that surround our time on Earth. I mean, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, you know, you can't see it. But when music is doing what it's supposed to do, it's interesting how everybody can feel it. And it's interesting the power that it has. At the same time, a guy who becomes the world's greatest architect is able to imagine something that doesn't exist and bring it into life. For that matter, a guy who's an excellent car mechanic is able to see a problem and somehow reconcile his place on Earth at that moment with that particular issue and achieve a certain resolution. And the way all of this sort of overlaps with existential issues of religion and the big questions that we all wrestle with, it's inseparable. Yet at the same time, I've learned so much from not only the process of being a musician, but from music itself, that I have to say there's a power and appeal to a genuine understanding of music that sets it apart that I think I recognize real early on. And as far as the impulse to share that, I think that whatever my nature is, if I notice something cool, I want to tell other people about it, whatever it is. I mean, if it's a new song or a, something that's going on, I want other people to know about that too, and also to see what other people think about it. So I think that's all just kind of built in for many of us to want to uh, sort of compare notes and share the things that we've found to be true or of interest. To achieve excellence requires dedication. To achieve... And I'll never forget when I was like a year later, 13 or something like that, finally understanding that they were playing a form that was recurring. It was like the greatest thing that ever happened. I mean, I couldn't stop smiling for a week. I had sort of like gotten into the code of it a little bit. And now, all these years later, if I hear that same track, I'll hear a million things that I never heard before. My sense of understanding in terms of the dialect that's being spoken is light years more evolved than it was then. But I'm still compelled to want to hear that. To me, that's kind of the key right there, is to follow that compass. I've been fortunate to be able to work with a lot of great artists functioning at a very high level, and I found most of them to be very self-critical to an extent that mere mortals might deem a little over the top. On the panorama of critical people, with one being somebody who's not critical and ten being somebody who's very critical, I would be eight easily, if not more. I'm very critical and rarely do I hear something that I'm playing on that I'm happy with. So what constitutes a mistake or what constitutes something being acceptable or not acceptable is a real slippery slope for me to even quantify. There's a point, if you're doing a record date, you get one take, two takes, well, let me hear both of them. And then, okay, the second one is a little bit better than the first one. But then there's, you know, a whole other thing, which is you're going to do a tour that's going to last for a year, and you're going to play 
maybe a couple of the same tunes every single night. Within that frame of mind, the possibility of self-criticism becomes infinitely more expansive, to the point where it's like, I should be playing a flat nine on that chord instead of a natural nine. Then it becomes, how do you play that flat nine? Then it becomes, what dynamic level you play that flat nine? And it becomes, which side of the pick do you use on that flat nine? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And each night when that moment comes up, those questions and all of that sense of what makes something correct or not correct come into play. You know, at that point, we're crossing into the territory we described before that is probably best described as mental illness. <laughs> I would guess that most people probably don't think about my world as being one, given the music that I play and the type of person that I appear to be and all that, one that has a lot of pressure surrounding it. But every night you're playing for people who mostly took a shower before the gig and parked their car and had to buy the ticket and I'm lucky to be able to play with many of the best musicians on the planet. You know, it's one thing to make one record and have it be pretty good, but to make a record after a record after another record after another record after another record and have them all be at a certain level, hopefully, and actually that's not even enough. It has to go beyond each time. It does add up to a certain kind of lifestyle that I've had to adjust to. Whether I could say that I thrive on it or not, time will tell. I guess the fact that I've been able to hang with it for this long and I'm still standing is probably something on the positive side. <laughs> um, you know, I can't really say that I enjoy a certain kind of pressure that I find I can alleviate by preparing. For that reason, before a, an important playing situation, if I can, I try to memorize the music. That may take days, but to me, it's worth the time that takes to alleviate this kind of pressure that is not the good kind of pressure. If I'm really comfortable with the music, then I can actually get to the more interesting kind of pressure, which is the ability to invoke many of the conceptual kinds of things that we've been talking about here that I really actually feel are more at the heart of whatever my thing is rather than worry about sort of like, okay, is this a C minor or a C7? And there's many subgroups of that preparation. There's a whole ritual for me of what I need to do before the concert each night. I mean, ritual is not the right word, but there's a set of things that I have found to be useful to kind of like allow me to hopefully get to the point where the first note of the concert is a moment where I'm really ready to address music with everything that that involves, which is a certain amount of pressure in a way that I think is probably good. I think it's a little bit like the good cholesterol and the bad cholesterol. <laughs> well, with that fat subject in mind, I wondered why Pat increases that pressure by playing as many as 240 gigs a year, with each concert lasting up to four hours. To me, any chance to play is a privilege. It's something that I feel, and as the years go on, this is even more so. I just feel like it's such an incredible opportunity to kind of be on Earth in my favorite possible way, to be able to take a look at music in the best possible environment, which is kind of what playing with great musicians is. I always kind of feel like each concert, that could be it. And I mean, that's kind of a cliche, that thing of certain musicians that play like every gig is the last gig. In my case, that's actually true. <laughs> I really do feel like, okay, this might be it. It doesn't matter to me if there's five people there. If I'm going to play for my kid's class, you know, like playing Mary Had a Little Lamb, you know, accompanying them on guitar, which I do, I still have to warm up for like two hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, and, and again, we're crossing into the mental illness thing. I'm yeah. just, it is sort of like that for me. In the context of my group, which is where the most extended concerts tend to happen, first of all, we're talking about a band that has a 30 plus year history with an incredibly big book and a bunch of music that is really worth playing. Even after all this time, it's really fun and exciting music to grab a hold of. And actually, as the years go by, the value that's sort of intrinsic to some of those pieces and to those notes becomes even clearer to me in this sort of me-to-me -me sense, in that I really do believe that 
the bridge to first circle is really cool. Like, yes, that is something worth doing right there. So, um, you know, when it's time to put together the set list, it's often like five or six hours long. Absolutely. I mean, but you don't even stop in the middle for milk and cookies. I actually think if we took a break, it wouldn't work. When it gets really good, it's one long tune. I'd say that my whole thing has been one long tune. From the first gigs that I played up till now, it's really kind of been one long set. There is a consistency and continuity there that makes this all sort of one continuous process. I was having fun with all this conceptual stuff, so I threw caution to the winds and asked Pat to comment on Frederick Nietzsche's statement, We have art so that we shall not die of reality. Pat took the bait and did not disappoint. Yeah, that Nietzsche guy, you know. (laughs) One thing about jazz is the way that it demands that a person offers a certain kind of individuality to each moment. Jazz guys are sort of asked to report, I would say, on their time on Earth in a way that's best served by a certain kind of immediacy, the kinds of things that improvisation is perfectly suited to do. In that sense, I would say that it's more of a hyper-reality. It's not a substitute for reality. To me, it becomes a substitute for reality when jazz becomes nostalgic, because I don't think it works on that level. I don't think that it's possible to recreate a previous era in jazz. It sort of actively resists that. For that matter, I don't think a musician can recreate something that they did before. I mean, if I wanted to redo Bright Size Life, my own record from 30 years ago, I couldn't do it. So in that sense, Jazz is separate from entertainment and is closer to the qualities that I think have been more connected to classical music. However, I think jazz also doesn't work as classical music as much as people try. We can find great notes written on a page, yet at the same time, hearing those notes played, I'm thinking about Duke Ellington right at the moment, hearing Duke's amazingly great notes played outside of the context of his existence and his spirit always seems to ring hollow. As much as it may have a certain kind of entertainment value, it doesn't seem to have this other value. Jazz demands from people to express something about not only who they are, but the time that they're living in. We have art so that we shall not die of reality. You take people somewhere else out of the world that we have where there's violence, killing, hatred, torture, misery, politics. You take them into a different place. People perceive it as a more spiritually aware place. Surely that can only happen because when you conceive of the music, it's doing the same thing for you. There's a certain craving and a certain desire that we all have for transcendence that is often found in the way people look for religion or attempt to find some spiritual center to how they conduct their activities that's worthy of note and I have my own uh, journey in that area and I would agree that my attraction to music is largely about trying to find some kind of meaning in the midst of everything that I can then filter through my own experiences and hopefully comes out sounding like something that somebody might want to hear. The only thing I can say whenever it comes up that people are looking for this intersection between music and spirituality is that any kind of humility that you can bring to the bandstand or that you can face music with is usually valuable in terms of the result that happens with sound. Whenever a musician seems to be really, really sure of what's going to happen, there can be an early payoff to that and it seems to have diminishing returns. Whenever a musician can invoke this sort of sense of wonder and awe of what music is, that seems to offer a much longer path towards something that is, I think, what we're, we're all looking for, which is something that continues on. My connection to music is one that follows that. I try to remain in service to music rather than the other way around. Every action is significant. A choice of a note is an action. Oh, 
I completely agree with that one. Sometimes finding the right first note is all you need. And often in the process of writing music, the first micro bit of information literally contains everything you need. One of my favorite ways of describing this is music is sort of everywhere around us. And our skill level is really the ability to identify more than the ability to create. If you can just use your skill as a sort of tool that can extract something without breaking it, you're given a window into a set of possibilities that offers you incredibly infinite opportunities if you have the ability to identify them. And that ability comes with practicing, studying, general insight into existence and life and all of the things that are also needed to become a good musician that have nothing to do with music. All of those seem to increase the precision by which you're able to extract things from this infinity of music that surrounds our heads at all time. A groove unifies the artist and the listener. Now you have been able to construct quite unusual, sophisticated grooves. Is your aim to unify on a more sophisticated level than let's go out and have a burger? <laughs> the only listener that I really know anything about is myself. I'm constantly amazed and I would say mostly puzzled by how other people perceive music. It's all about clothes and haircuts and fashion and general degrees of cultural divisions that are being projected under the auspices of music. I have no idea what they're talking about. For that matter, when people talk about this is heavy metal, this is emo, this is punk, this is pop, this is rock, this is jazz, mostly I don't know what they're talking about. In terms of the context that I'm actually looking at music, none of this matters at all. I have absolutely no sense of how anybody else is perceiving anything. And I hate to say it, but that includes the majority of people that would come to a gig of mine. What I found, just try to play for the listener inside me. And yes, in answer to your question, that listener does want to hear things that he has not heard before. Not time signature, certain kind of harmony, whatever. I mean. The fan that I am of music has an incredible hunger for hearing new things. Usually when I'm writing something, I'm not thinking that it's in any particular time signature or key. You know, I think more just in terms of what existed in that first little burst of what the idea is that makes me in this territory to start with, uh, and then sort of trying to follow it, let it be whatever it's going to be. I will add, though, that I'm very sensitive and aware of what the strengths are of the people that I'm playing with. And to a large degree, I'm ordering up things that are going to suit those people. If I'm going to do a tour playing with Roy Haynes, that's going to offer different opportunities than if I'm doing a tour with the group and vice versa. I've always loved the thing that Steve Swallow used to describe when it's time to write tunes, of it being a little bit like ordering a burger at a deli. You know, as you're walking to the deli, you think about what you'd like to have on your burger and the fact that you want a burger in the first place, and you place your order. And to a certain degree, there's an act of faith there that at a certain point, you're going to get the burger. With a tune, it's sort of like that. I need a up-tempo something-something that's going to be on that tour with Roy that's coming up. I didn't ask for a grilled cheese with lettuce and tomato. I'm asking for a burger with whatever. And you, at that point, place an order. And in, in the case of a tune, it may take a week or two or a month or a year. But what's funny is that that tune tends to show up. <laughs> well, if you'd like to make another date with Pat Metheny and me, Richard Niles, show up same time next week as we concentrate on the instrument Pat has explored, expanded, and revolutionized, the guitar. The show features him guitar in hand, demonstrating just how he do that voodoo that he do so well. Thanks to my production assistant, Yannick Wisdala, engineer Peter Dale, and to David Morley, that most executive producer and all at Above the Title. Thanks most of all to Pat Metheny for giving his time so generously, offering us a unique insight into his very bright-sized life. Richard Niles on the radio, on the radio jacket. Yeah.